Hi, Martin Shearer here from Tesseract Restoration Studio. And um, in this issue, I wanted to address the subject of the bonding agent, Hickstall. Uh, I use it quite a lot in my business. Uh, it's indispensable in my business. I get a lot of questions about it, so I wanted to uh, address that in a video. And so what I'll have here are uh, some uh, random examples of how I use this product in my business. The, the different ways I use this product, the different ways you could use this product. Um, how to use it, some tips and tricks in using it. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to address everything I wanted to in this um, series because I have to essentially wait until an occasion arises that I can use as a good example and I would film that and if that occasion doesn't arise well I don't have it <laughs> so those uh, instances will appear in future episodes as I uh, come across them because there are some very good uh, and interesting and useful um, things I want to show you that are not in this series um, <clears throat> this may end up being a two part uh, series because the, it ended up being fairly long and I instead I didn't want to uh, speed up the um, parts of the video that I would normally do that and since it's, this is a more of an educational um, presentation I figured the people who want to see this sort of thing want to see this sort of thing all the way through so um, let's go and uh, start this thing off. So here is the hot box you've heard so much about. It is an old <clears throat> freezer that has been uh, gutted and uh, converted to uh, a hot box instead of a cold box. So let's have a look at the inside. So what we have essentially is a freezer. We took all the shelves out of it and uh, refastened them securely to the walls. They're, they are bolted in there. So this is very strong. And uh, what we have is in the bottom, let's see if I can get you down here. There is, uh, that's a fan. That black thing is a fan. And above it, there is a electric stove element. You see that wavy black line in there. That's a heating element from an electric electric oven. So we have that and the fan below it to circulate the hot air. And uh, this plugs into the wall, 110 outlet, and then up here there is a thermocouple. It's a probe that measures the temperature. I have a oven thermometer in here. And that probe runs out through the wall to the other side where I have a thermostat. Where I can set the uh, oven temperature, the <laughs> hot box temperature, I can have it on heat or warm and this will turn itself off and on as needed to regulate the temperature that I set it at. Right now it is set at 170 degrees. That's it. That's the hot box. You're essentially talking about an insulated box with a heating element in it. It could be an, a heating element. It could be a, a, a high voltage uh, floodlight or some sort of other heat source and some way to regulate the temperature. You could have a vent that could be opened and closed to regulate the heat. Uh, it's a good idea to have a fan in there. But there are a number of ways you could do this with the insulated hard insulation uh, from construction sites. It comes in sheets. You can cut it up, make a box any size you like. Um, you can use an old cooler to make a small one, uh, a small hot box and put a heating element in. If you wanted to have something like this made, you could gather the parts, get yourself a heating element, 
the an old freezer maybe uh, the thermostat and uh, approach an electrician to have them safely build this thing for you uh, it's a pretty simple job for them anyway that's what a hot box is mine's big enough to hold a fairly large object uh, I don't really want to work on anything bigger than what will fit in here anyway uh, so there you have it hot box So I get requests for this, uh, so I'm showing it. Uh, I have requested how, how do we mix our epoxies and all that jazz. So the way that you mix Hickstall is you need to measure it, it you need to, by weight. And uh, typically you're using very small amounts. So the way I do it, and I would suggest you do it, is you get yourself some of these little glass beakers. I, I get them online. They're, I get them used. You can get them for 50 cents a piece, but you have to buy, I think, 10 minimum. And uh, just do a search on used uh, 10 cc uh, or 10 milliliter, not cc, 10 milliliter used glass scientific beakers. And you can you know there's many places online where you can find them so if you're going to do this kind of work you, one of the things you need to do is start learning how to do good searches research and finding what you need online this stuff is called Hickstall here's the name of it the, the way it's sold is you'll see it typically listed this Talus is the company I bought this batch from they make book binding materials. Why they need this stuff, I have no idea. But I got a good price, so I got it from them. It's called Hickstall NYL-1. This is a 60 gram kit. This is the smallest thing you can buy. Where I get it, it runs me about $20, 18 to $20. It's done by weight in a 3 to 1 ratio. So, the smallest batch that you can make and get a reasonably good mixture is 0.9 grams of part A. I have my beaker up there. I'm setting my scale to 0.9 grams. And then I just put drops of it until my weight comes up to what I need. then add three more three to one one third of nine is three so we go nine and three is twelve I get it up to 1.2 not 12 1.2 grams and again I just go by weight add drops this is part B it's a lot thinner And that is the exact amount I need. And so that's the amount you'll get. That's 1.2 grams. And we just mix it. I have a glass rod again. Look them up online. This is a one inch, one eighth inch glass rod. They come in about six inches or eight inches long, and I just break them to the size I need them. This, I use this because metal and wood can contaminate this mixture. And uh, we don't want to do anything to compromise the color or the bonding qualities of this. So essentially I just mix it. It's a little hard to see since they're both clear. You just mix it a bunch. What I do is I mix it for... I don't know, 30 seconds. I'll get a lot of... Can you see in there? 
I get a lot of bubbles in it. So what I do is I mix it for about 30 seconds, then I let it sit for a couple of minutes, and I stir it again, and then I let it set again to let the bubbles come out. And then it's ready to use. So the idea is with Hixtel, I use it to repair non-porous objects. Pretty much exclusively glass and uh, the finest porcelain, which looks like glass. And um, it is uh, very, very strong and it can wick into cracks that you couldn't get glue into. In other words, you might have a broken a crack in a vase and you can't pull it apart to let glue get in there. So you, I heat it up in a hot box to 150 degrees and I take it out and I put a few drops of this along the crack. Let it sit for a couple of minutes and you'll see that it will get sucked right down into that crack. The curing time on this is five to seven days if you just let it sit on a shelf at room temperature. I can accelerate that by uh, by adding heat. I'll take that object that I put the uh, Hixtel on back in the hot box, pull it out in about 15 minutes, wipe off the excess, put it back in the hot box, and then that's cured in a day, one to three days, depending on how much Hixtel I'm putting on the object. Because sometimes I'll use Hixtel as a fill on a, a glass object, and I'll instead of filling a crack, I'll fill a chip. I basically sit it in the hot box so that the object, the filled portion of the object is at a level orientation, and I fill that with Hixtel and just let gravity do my work for me. And in a couple of days, that's pretty darn strong. I can add more to it by then if I have to until I get that uh, void filled. But um, five to seven days for a full cure on this uh, at room temperature. Eh, one to three days roughly at, with heat added to it. Cleanup of Hixtel. Uh, before it sets up, you can use um, rubbing alcohol on a tissue to wipe with. You want to damp, not wet, because you don't want to uh, get any of that solvent into the crack that you just filled or at the edge of the crack. This is just for wiping off the excess that's dripping down the side. Um, the only thing I know of that can dissolve this stuff once it's cured is acetone. And it's not easy. Uh, it, for cleanup on the outside of something that you can wipe down, you can get it off with acetone. But to, to get it out of a crack, like if you misalign the crack and it's the glue set up on you, it's going to be very, very difficult to get that off. Uh, you just have to soak it in uh, acetone. And some objects are too big. You can't. It's very, very dangerous to have that much alcohol or that much acetone you know, in a bowl or something, or you have the object sitting in it, soaking in it. That's extremely dangerous. I would say do not do that. But, uh, yeah, it, it's very, very difficult to undo this. You need to be very careful and neat with your working with this stuff. Okay, so I'm ready to apply my Hextel. So what I want to do is bond these pieces together first. And since I have so many areas where there are voids, where there's spaces, uh, it would be difficult to, to get this Hixtel in there if it's together. I'll make sure I have it everywhere I need it. So it's just easier for me to apply it by hand before I tape it together because I can see all the surfaces that need it and I'm just put drops of this on the glass rod and spread it on here and it's really easy to get too much on there and you want to try to avoid that so I'll put a drop on and spread it around it, it spreads very far 
So I have my pre-cut pieces of tape. Good idea to have those made ahead of time. So all I need to do is reach over and grab them. With my good alignment. I'll tape that. Get another piece to put on the other side. Press it down. Make sure my alignment is good. And I, again, pre-cut, prepared ahead of time. Paper towel pieces. I wipe off my excess, keeping things neat, and that's ready to go. So now I'll bring in the other main portion and we do the same operation I, this time I'm just going to go from here to here with the Hextel now again I got one drop of the on here I'll show you how far this stuff goes okay I put it just touch it on here and I you can't see this probably on that video but that one drop I'm able that was on here I'm able to spread along here so far I've gone more than halfway a little bit of this stuff goes a long way I'm, I'm reaching over here pulling up the excess and spreading it So I'm, and and that's, more of this is going to squeeze out when I put this together, believe it or not. Look at that. I've managed to get that one drop to go all the way across the bottom. Now, it's really hard to do that on the places where there's a, like one or two spots. So I'm knocking some of it off in the jar before I bring it out. Touch it just to the ends of some of these basket weave parts I got a rough area right in here I want to make sure I have plenty of Hixel in there and the neater you are applying this the easier your job of cleanup is going to be alright so now put it together. There's a bit of squeeze out. I want to wipe it off. Double checking my alignment. I'll press this side down and then pull it tight. again on the other side. Now, you do the fingernail test. Run your fingernail across the crack. If you don't get a catch, you've got it aligned properly. And wipe 
wipe off my squeeze out here. It's very, very minimal. Squeeze out. You need to be careful when you're working with gold on ceramics because on some golds you could actually pull it off with this tape. I've already done a test on this piece in an inconspicuous area, so I know that's not going to happen. Okay, now I'm going to put this piece in. So, again, we go with a Hextal. Now, it's easier to put the Hickstall on this than it is to go down in here and get it on all these parts. So, again, I'll just touch it along here. I don't want to get too much on. press and pull pull these pieces together and now I want to wipe off my squeeze out cut a couple more pieces of tape place. Here we go. I can't see the cracks. I have to... <laughs> I got good alignment. That's great. Let's see. We're right here. I can't even see it on this side. So now um, I have still some pieces of the handles on either side to go in here, but I'm going to leave them off for now. The reason is 
I have this chip here that needs to be filled and then filed or worked on and it's just a lot easier to do that than it is to work around this with my tools because I'll have to get up under here and around there and it just limits my ability to get my tools in there. So if I leave it off and fill this and smooth it and come back later uh, to bond this in, that will make it easier to work on this. The other thing is if I wait a couple days, this will get thicker, the Hickstool will get thicker and then I can actually put this in place when I'm done working on that area. I can get this in place and hardly use any tape at all to hold that in place. The, uh, the, the stickiness of the partially cured Hickstool will make that possible. And then on the other side, I have um, a missing, can you see this spot right here? I have a missing piece of uh, basket weave, if you will, that goes in there. And it's the same thing on, on that side. I have other issues to deal with over here, and it's just going to be easier if I don't have this hand on my way. So. We'll do some filling and some filing on here and uh, get that all accomplished and then uh, we can go ahead and bond those pieces in place. There are some places, it's hard to work in, down inside these baskets because it's very deep, it has a flat bottom so you can't get a straight tool in there to file, it all has to be done by hand, very difficult. The other thing is, if we look at the bottom here, we've got perfect alignment on that. There will be no fills down there uh, on the bottom. So that means I won't have to repaint any of that rose, which is a huge relief for me. It's very difficult to, uh, again, so every time I paint something, I have to cold glaze it and file and buff and uh, sand and buff. And it's just really hard to do that down inside a, a flat bottom deep vessel so that's what this is it for today this will go into the hot box and speed up the curing on that the Hickstel uh, if I let this out all day that would be pretty much useless tomorrow um, it would still be it'd be really really thick like Vaseline but uh, it would lose a lot of its workability so in the meantime what I do is I put that in a freezer it will extremely slow down the curing process. It won't freeze. And I put a uh, cover on it with some cling wrap. That will seal it. That goes in the freezer. I take it out tomorrow. It takes about 10 minutes to thaw out and it's ready to go again. Each time I do that, it will get slightly thicker. I can probably freeze and thaw it for about two or three days in a row. Each time it will get thicker. So about the third day uh, that I do that, I'll be able to do what I just described as far as uh, the bonding the handles on. Okay, that's all for today. So this is uh, an object that I've taken the time to assemble with tape so I could demonstrate the uh, application of the Hickstel on a piece that's already assembled with tape. It's been in, put in a hot box, 150 degrees, I bring it out, I put this Hickstel on here and that helps wick it into the cracks. So I've heated this in my hot box. This is of 150 degrees right now. And then I have my Hickstel and a glass rod and we just put it right on the crack. You probably can't see the actual Hickstel. I'm gonna try to find the crack and just run a bead of this on there along the crack and it will the heat will draw it into the crack. The heat makes it thinner, which makes it wick into the crack easier. Uh, 
I'm going to do some of these on the inside. I don't know if you can. And then the rest I'm going to do on the outside. I'm going to use a bean bag to uh, keep my vase from rolling away on me. Very good alignment on here. It's difficult to even see the cracks. But I'll get enough on here so that when I take the tape off in a couple days, I'll put this in the hot box for a couple days, uh, it'll be strong enough to hold itself together with the tape removed and then I'll be able to get to all the parts underneath the tape where this Hickstel did not flow. the glass rod find the edge of my crack. So I'm, I'm going to show you how I make this little tool I use a lot. Um, I use these double-edged razor blades that I cut in half and make little scrapers out of them to cut my tape off. And the reason I do that is because they're nice and thin and they can conform to the curvature of the ceramics I'm working on. So what I do is I take a pair of scissors and I cut these apart. And then I'll take some masking tape so that this other edge doesn't hurt me. I'll put a couple layers on there. I, these don't last very long. But if you're very aggressive with this, you could actually get these. This is sharp enough. It's or thin enough. It'll go right through your skin. So we put a, a backing on it. And I'll show you how we use that. Okay, so it's the next day. This has been in the hot box overnight. And I'm going to take the tape off and there will be some places on here where the tape sticks because of the Hickstall. The Hexel isn't fully cured, but it's strong enough that this is going to hold itself together while well, I add a little more Hexel to get all the places that are uh, that were underneath this tape that the bonding agent may not have flowed into. And 
So I have my little razor scrapers that I get the scrape the tape off and there's some Hextel residue on here too. It's difficult to see in the video but there's some clear glue stuck on here. We want to scrape it all off before it gets fully cured because it will get harder to remove then. This is a very handy little tool because I can bend it around this surface to conform to the curvature. So now we'll do the inside. Got some residue here. getting down in here now or my hands are going to start getting in the way you won't be able to see what I'm doing but you get the idea it's just a, the adhesive that got underneath the tape it stuck to the tape adhesive it glued the adhesive from the tape onto this object and now I'm just basically scraping it all out it's a lot easier to get off now than it will be when it's fully cured and I'm getting ready to do a second round of Hixel on this where, as I said, wherever there was a lot of tape, it may not have, the bonding agent may not have flowed underneath the tape. So I'm just going to add more to make sure I got it where it's supposed to be. So um, I had my Hixel in my beaker pre-mixed. This is leftover from yesterday. It spent the night in the freezer and I've thawed it out. It's still very liquid, very thin. I have taken all the tape off and I've scraped with my razor. This is a missing shard I don't have and that will get filled. I'll have to fill that with some A plus B epoxy. And anyway, so today we're just putting more Hickstall on these cracks. I want to make sure we get good penetration with this stuff. I'm pretty confident I've already got it very well distributed amongst the cracks, but if you're not sure just put more on because you can always wipe extra off. Okay, I just wanted to get the worst of it. But I've got a good, hear that ring? If you have a crack in it, it's like a bell. It will not ring 
soundly. It will not ring true, but that tells me we don't have any funky large sections of weak joints. So this will go back in the hot box again. I'll uh, leave it in there for 15 minutes or so, maybe 20 minutes. This will thin and penetrate some more. I will go out then, wipe off any excess, and put it back in the uh, hot box overnight. And we will be done with the bonding part of this job.